covenant for just a little bit. So open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, or excuse me, uh, to Luke chapter 13. This morning we're talking about uh, the woman who was bent over in half, bowed together. I think this a, is a perfect, in my opinion, it's a perfect illustration, spiritually speaking, of many people in the church today, in the body of Christ. This woman was tormented. She was afflicted. Uh, spirit of infirmity was upon her for 18 long years. When she got healed, you think the religious people would have been excited, the Pharisees, but they weren't. They were critical because it didn't happen in a way, the form, the fashion they thought it should have. And Jesus said, your traditions have nullified the word of God. So this is Luke chapter 13, verse 10. Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on a Sabbath day. Uh, now this is not abnormal because if you look down here in verse 22, and Jesus went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. So we know that teaching is extremely important. Because he's, the Bible says you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. We, we got to be taught. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that, that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's why we have the scriptures. That's why God gave the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. So we got to be taught. Say, I've got to be taught. From the moment you're born in this world, you're taught something. A lot of times what we're taught is wrong. See, we've got, we, we got to be taught what the will, the heart, the mind of the Father is. And Jesus was teaching in verse 10 on the Sabbath day, and he was in a synagogue on the Sabbath day. Uh, there's a book I'm in the process of writing right now called Why We Must Gather Together 30 Biblical Reasons. It's amazing. I, I, I thought before, I, you know, before God laid upon my heart to write this book, and it's not going to be a thick book because... Because each answer or each reason could, could be a book in itself. But I could not find any books in the, in, in the church world in America of why we should gather. And that's one of the main reasons why the body's dying across Europe. They stop gathering together. Sheep need to gather together. Go, bah. See, we're one of God's sheep. We're one of God's little lambs. So people, the devil gets it into their head Oh, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to come together. But isn't that amazing? That's where God shows up. Now, God will show up in your prayer closet. I'm not denying that. God will show up in your life individually, but we need each other. That's why he gave us gifts. We're called the body of Christ, members in particular. You know, toes, hands, eyes, nose, mouth, ears. That's symbolic of us. So we need, but he was in the Sabbath day. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit, had a spirit of infirmity, 18 years. Now, we could talk about spirits of infirmity, unclean spirits. I know some people get into trying to speak to the demonic powers inhabiting people's bodies. But I want you to know that not every spirit that Jesus dealt with was dealt with by telling a spirit to come out because sometimes it's an outside influence upon the physical body. It's not an inward presence. And I don't really want to get into this great detail, but I have researched it, I've studied it, and there's a lot of doctrines out there. There are some people that have you to believe every sickness, every disease, every infirmity is a demonic possession. That is not true. That is not true. It's just Jesus. If that was true, then every time Jesus would have told. Jesus did not tell. Now, what Jesus did here, though, he did speak to the woman, and he said to the woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmities. And then after he spoke to the woman, he laid hands on her. That's the biblical example. We speak to the mountain. We speak to the problem. And then we lay hands. Uh, I'm not going to get technical. I'm just saying that's how Jesus did it. Sometimes there, there's been times when the Spirit of God was really moving strong in my life. And the Lord would have me not to lay my hands upon the person until I, after I had spoken to the problem. Sometimes, I know it sounds strange, the Lord spoke to me and said they didn't get healed because you laid your hands too soon. 
I know that sounds strange. But I want you to notice that Jesus had been in the synagogue his whole life. And up to that time, now of course, since he's been baptized in the Holy Ghost, but up to the time he was baptized in the Holy Ghost, he had not healed one person. I mean, this is important. Up to the time that Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan and the Holy Ghost came upon him in the form of a dove, he had not healed one person. Jesus, his whole life until he was 30 years old, was walking by the blind, the crippled, the infirmed, the possessed, the hurting. He had never healed a person. Never healed a person until the Holy Ghost came upon him. And actually, that's why Jesus told his disciples, now listen to me, guys. Now, I know they healed people in the name of Jesus. They were operating in the authority of Christ. They were not operating in his anointing. They were operating in the authority that is found in the name of Jesus. Because in the name of Jesus, but now, God does not only want us to operate in the authority of Christ, but in the anointing of Christ. He wants us to operate in the spirit. And he says, you'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. You'll be baptized in fire. And he said, the signs and the wonders and the miracles I did, you'll do. But this woman had been going to the synagogue, I believe, her whole life and never got healed. 18 years, never got healed. I think that's a real shame that people can come to the house of God their whole life and they walk out just as sick as when they came. They walk out just as messed up. Uh, we're talking about an infirmity to where they're bowed over, okay, I'm talking about she could not lift her eyes up. Her eyes were on the ground. She could not lift up her eyes to heaven. She, she was so afflicted and so tormented and so sick. And, and so I cannot imagine being bent over. And I've seen people like this. I've been in stores sometimes, and I see a little old lady or a little old man, and their little back is bent like somebody would take a branch and bend it in half. And they have to walk like that. That is not the will of God. This woman's infirmity was not the will of God. We discovered this morning, though, there was nobody to help her. Or I'll say it this way. There was nobody who was in a spiritual condition of being able to help her. I'm totally convinced the reason why many people in the church have not gone deeper in God than they have is because we don't have men and women where they should be spiritually, including Pastor Mike. If I really was where I needed to be, oh, don't misunderstand me. I thank God for all the healings I've seen, all the miracles I've seen, all the people's lives I've, I've touched by the Spirit of God. But I know this, that God wants to do so much more. But we're not where we need to be spiritually. And he said to his disciples, he said, the Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. How many of you got flesh to deal with? I mean, I know, come on, how many times the Spirit of God woke me up at 3 o'clock in the morning and said, Son, I want you to pray. Uh, okay, Father, I will, I will just let me, let me go to sleep a little bit longer. Son, I want you to fast. Oh, Lord, Lord you, know, you know, I really do want to fast, Lord, but you know, you know, I just, Lord, you know, man, I sure could use a bite to eat right now. Huh? I, I, I stop and talk to that person. You know, Lord, I, 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 would, I would really talk to that person, but, you know, I, I, I've got to go do this first. I mean, that's this flesh. Flesh is always rising up, and you've got to crucify it. You've got to die daily to it. You've got you to deny yourself and take up your cross. We've got to get, come on, even in the world, if a person's not obsessed with a certain subject, they'll never be an expert at it. You've got to become obsessed with it. I'm totally convinced that Peter, James, John, Paul, Timothy were all obsessed with Jesus Christ. Obsessed with Jesus Christ. See, see, I can't help people get free unless I'm obsessed with Jesus. We have to be full of Jesus. Hey, full of Jesus. We got to be full of Jesus. I mean, we just got to be. And nobody, and here's the thing, is somebody's got to break through. See, breakthrough. Somebody's got to have a breakthrough. We got, somebody's got to. I mean, God, I believe that God's going to do it, too. I'm totally convinced that God is going to do it. There's going to be a breakthrough. I mean, I, I, I know we've all had spiritual breakthroughs. How many of you ever had a spiritual breakthrough in your life? Isn't that exciting when it happens? Whoo, God shows up in a little measure, a little, but a little dab won't do us. See, we think it does, but it doesn't. But then we become content. Oh, yeah, I had an experience with God. I remember God touched me back in 1925. No, when's the last time God touched you? Because, see, Jesus touched this woman. 
We need a touch of heaven. I need a touch of heaven. I'm not talking about, I, I know this sounds insane. I know this sounds ridiculous. But I was talking to my friend yesterday, Gordon Klingenschmidt, and, and I was telling him, Gordon, this morning, I, I was talking before service, and he was going to go preach somewhere else. And I said, Gordon, I said, I am so glad I have not in the natural been successful because then I wouldn't be seeking God the way I am. See what happens, you get two, three hundred people, you get good income coming in, you get good attendance, it seems like you got success, and guess what? Well, hallelujah, I'm all right, I'm okay, God's here, and you don't press in because we're not thinking about the billions and billions of people outside of the four walls of this building. We're not thinking about their souls. We're just thinking about I'm a success. I've got 300 people. I've got 500 people. I've got 1,000 people. I must be a success. That don't make you a success. How about all the other thousands of souls lost? Lost. Millions. Well, Pastor Mike, it must not be God's will for them to be saved. Oh, it is saved. Jesus said this. He said the harvest is great. Matter of fact, one time the Bible says he was moved with compassion for the multitudes, and he healed the sick, and he said this. He said the harvest is great but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into the harvest field. Now he wasn't just talking about people out there, he was talking about people like him that were sold out lock, stock, and barrel for the will of the Father. I mean, we gotta be sold out to the will of the Father. And so this woman, she couldn't get help. She needed a divine, supernatural intervention. I'm telling you right now, People need a divine, supernatural intervention. They just don't need to hear another sermon. I believe in the preaching of the word. They don't need just someone else laying hands on them again. They need a divine touch of God. They need to be so touched of God that they walk away saying, that was God. That's what happened here. It was so awesome and powerful that if you take a look a little bit further down in verse, in verse 20 in... Um, in uh, verse, take a look here. In verse 17, and when he had said these things, all of his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. I mean, something happened. People said, that was God, that was God, that was God. That's what, that, whoa, that was the Lord. Um, when's the last time people have left the church and they bragged about God? They said, oh, that was God. That was God. They don't go walk away and say, oh, wasn't that beautiful singing? Oh, wasn't that a wonderful sermon? No, they walked away. That little lady who could not straighten herself up. Most people will never be able to straighten up and fly right without a divine intervention. They will not be able to. How many know what I'm talking about? Say, well, Pastor Mike, I, I, I straightened up. Uh, I, I, I flew right. Can I guarantee if you look Back to that time, you were touched by God. That's how you straightened up. That's how I straightened up. God touched me. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And all oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened and now I know he touched me and made me whole. See, he touched me. He touched me. Not some famous evangelist, not some famous preacher, not some famous person. Jesus touched me. They need a touch of Jesus. Whew, if we only knew that in our heart, if we could just cry out, say, Lord, please touch him. Please make yourself rude to him. I remember I was preaching in the carnival. It was a Huntington Fair, and God was showing up, and people were walking under the power back in 1980, 81. And, and uh, there was a tall man standing behind a tree, an oak tree, watching an older man. And, I, I, and one night, night I went out to talk to him. He turned around and walked away, and I ran up, and I, said, I stopped him. I said, sir, I said, I've been watching you behind this oak tree all the time. And I said, I'd like to talk to you. He said, oh, you can't help me. He told me his name was George Fitzgerald. He said, you can't help me. He said, I'm an atheist. He said, I'm the, uh, he said, I'm the treasurer for this Huntington Fair. And I said, George, 
I said, I might not be able to touch you. I said, I might not be able to help you. I said, but I know someone who will. He said, I don't believe in God. I said, listen, just do me a favor. Just one little flavor. He said, what's that? I said, just do this. I said, just pray a prayer. Say, Jesus, if you're real, make yourself real to me. For now, it's touch me, Jesus. Jesus, if you're really real, touch me. He started laughing. He said, I'm not going to do it. No, he didn't laugh. He said, I'm not going to do it. I started laughing. I said, George. That's all I'm asking her to do is say, Jesus, if you're real, touch me. And so we left. I gave him my telephone number. A couple of weeks went by later after the tent services, and he called me up. And the very first thing he said, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I started laughing because I, I knew God had already got a hold of him. I said, George. I said, just say, Jesus, touch me. Jesus, if you're real, touch me. Make yourself real to me. My wife had gotten his address, and so she wrote him a letter and encouraged him to just simply do that. And so my wife and I went to Europe for nine months, came back, and I walked into a favorite. I walked into a friend's church of mine, and guess who was in there? There was George with his hands lifted up, tears rolling down his face, praising God. I went to him after the service. He became an elder in that church. And I went to George. I said, George, what happened? He said, I did what you said. I reached out and I said, Jesus, if you're real, make yourself real to me. And he touched me. He touched me and he transformed his life. See, people need a touch of Jesus. They really do. They need, that's all they need. They need Sometimes when I pray for people, sinners, a lot of times I don't pray no fancy prayer, no long-winded prayer. I'll just take their hand and I'll say, oh, Jesus. I've done it to people on the streets who are uh, caught up in alcohol and drugs, who were doped out. I would just reach my hands out and say, oh, Lord, touch them right now. Just touch them. Just touch them, Lord, touch them. And God would touch them and they'd be good to cry. I prayed for this one construction worker. His wife had ran off with another man. And he was sitting there, and I said, let me just pray for you. I said, I want, I want to believe that God's going to touch you right now. And so I said, I want you to pray a little prayer. And he prayed a little prayer. And I said, Jesus, basically, I said, Jesus, touch him. And all of a sudden, he began to weep almost literally like buckets of water. The snot was flowing. The tears were flowing. His name was Irv Kleinden. And he just began to weep and cry. He says, what's happening? What's happening? I said, Jesus is touching you. Jesus is touching you. I went to pray for a man one time. His, he was up in the McConnellsburg Hospital, and the Elvin Bloom bought. He owed a, a sawmill. It's still there. His sons run it. His son runs it with his sons, and up in Shirley'sburg, and he had a big sawmill, and he had a big lumber cutting company where they cut down logs and or trees and log them out. And and he was dying from cancer in McConnellsburg Hospital, and they shoved him in a little room that was a death room, and they asked me to go pray for him. And so I spent a day fasting in prayer, and I went up there and I walked in, and his skin was yellow. His eyes of his eyes were yellow. He was skinny. You could see the ribs of his bones. And I began to at, talk to him about Jesus. And he was very, his mind was, he was very awake. And his, his tongue was like a razor blade. And he basically began to accost me. And I, I backed up and I lifted my eyes towards heaven. And all I could do was say, Jesus, please. I said, touch this man. Lord, please touch this man. And he began to weep. He began to cry. And he gave his heart to Jesus. And I laid my hands on him, and I prayed over him in the name of Jesus. And I said, devil, loose him and let him go. And, and I walked away. It didn't seem like anything had happened. He hadn't been eaten for days and days. But as I walked out the door, I heard later that day his appetite came back, and he asked for food, and he began to eat. And John died, has disappeared, and the cancer began to disappear out of his body. And three days later, he was home, and he was back to work. Jesus touched him. <laughs> not my gagger. See, people need a touch of Jesus. People need to be delivered. And I, I really do believe with all my heart that the Old Covenant, the Old Testament is a type and an illustration and an example of the will of God, what God wants to do, to do. You know, it says, He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sin is from the beginning. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And then it says in Acts 10, 38, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Ghost and power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. Don't, don't misunderstand me. Our little girl, Naomi, we put her to bed one night. She had gotten terribly hurt. Two and a half years, we put her to bed one night on uh, 2010 in the spring, and she was gone home to be with the Lord. It was in the spring of 2000, no, no, 2000, the spring of 2000, she was going home to be with the Lord. But you know what? She's in heaven waiting for us. 
But I do know it was the will of God to heal her. I don't get tormented over it. I believe it was, I believe it's the will of God to heal everybody. I really do. Now, some people, I will admit that unless they would have hit the bottom of the burrow, they would have never got saved because they don't get desperate. Everything's hunkadory. Everything's all right. Some people just won't get right with God. And matter of fact, Jesus, and I'm, talk, I'm, I'm, not, I'm talking about Paul one time. There was a man who was living in sin with his father's wife. And Paul said, I've turned such a one over to the devil for the destruction of the flesh, for the saving of the soul. So the physical, the physical healing of the body, it's important. Don't misunderstand me. I, I believe in healing. I, I'm, 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 God's healed me many times. But really, the condition of the soul is way more important than the physical body. I've gone into hospitals, and people were dying from a disease. And really, what I really, what I really get after is I want to make sure they know Jesus. That's what's important to me. I want to make sure they know Jesus, because if they don't know Jesus, you could get them healed. This actually happened. I went one time to visit someone in the Gettysburg Hospital. And as I was walking by the door, it was just quick to me. I saw a man laying in the bed. It was just quick. I don't know how this happened. Just go pray for him. So I walked in there and began to talk to the man a little bit. And sometimes I wear a minister's collar when I go into the hospital because the reason why I'm not religious, but the doctors and the nurses will leave me alone. They'll leave me alone. Where if I go in there just like, like an everyday Joe, well, sir, who are you? Did you check in? But I go in with a little collar. I go in with my minister's collar. I look like a Catholic priest. I go in and say, hey, and, and if the doctor is in there and the nurses are in the room with someone I know, I say, can you please excuse me for a little bit of time? I need to spend some time with my parishioner. Oh, yes, Reverend. And they walk right out. Where if I would have just walked in there and asked him to do that, they say, who do you think you are? So it's stupid what a little piece of plaster can do. It's just like a sheriff badge. So I walked into this man's room. He saw my minister's collar. I said, what's going on, sir? He says, well, I've got cirrhosis of the liver. He said, I'm dying. Well, I'm sure it was from alcohol. I didn't dig. I said, well, listen. I said, Jesus will touch you right now. I said, he'll heal you. He will? I said, Jesus will heal you. Laid my hands on him, prayed over him, left Never saw him again. About two years later, someone came to me and said, Pastor Mike, I was out on the streets today passing out tracks. He said, I walked up to this man. He said, I went to give him a track. And he said, oh, I, uh, where are you from? I'm from Jesus his Lord. He said, I know your pastor. He said, how do you know him? He said, I was dying from cirrhosis of the liver. As I've been laying in the hospital dying here in Gettysburg. He walked into my office. He walked into my office. He walked into my hospital room, laid his hands on me, and Jesus healed me. As far as I know, he never lived for God. Whew. That's amazing how people can get healed and yet not serve the one who saved him or rescued him or healed him. But in Exodus chapter 3, it was prophesied to Abraham by God that the children of Israel would end up in Egypt and that they would become slaves of the Pharaoh. And it actually tells us, and actually that's one of the, that's, that, that's the sermon that Philip preached, not, yeah, Philip, Stephen preached before they killed him. He talked about how their forefathers had risen up against the prophets and about how God had brought them out of slavery. And I believe this, and, and you know, Moses knew he was called of God to bring deliverance, and this is Exodus chapter 3, in verse 2, we can begin there, but Moses knew he was called of God to bring deliverance to, to, to Israel out of the hands of the Egyptians. But you know what? He didn't succeed, did he? It, he for, at 40 years old, he killed an Egyptian trying to help the Israelites, and they rejected him. He was so disappointed and discouraged in the fact that he had killed another Egyptian that he ran into the wilderness for 40 years. 40 years. He... he Listen, I believe there was within his heart a cry to help people. But he could not deliver the people without the mighty hand of God. I'm telling you right now, I know if you're a child of God, there is a cry in your heart to help people. That's the nature of Christ. 
I want to help people. I want to see people healed. I want to see people delivered. I want to see people live for God. I want to see people love God. But we can't do it in ourselves. We need, to, we need to be empowered from on high. Now, I will say this. The danger, and I can't get into great detail. We could get into it. Today, we have, we have misplaced confession for reality. What do I mean by that? Florence, people are confessing all these great, amazing things about who they are. But they're not living who they are. For other words, it's not just confessing I'm righteous. It's living righteous. Now, how do we live righteous? We do it by faith. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Faith in who? For, for who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So when I have faith, see, the Lord spoke to me years ago. He said, son, you can have faith to get people healed, and you can have faith to get your financial needs met. He said, you can have faith to, you know, to move mountains, he said. But he said, you've got to first have faith to kill the giants in your own life. For in other words, you've got to have faith to overcome the things in your life that are displeasing to God. Things in your life, attitudes, thoughts, desires, motives, actions. Why? Because I got to have faith to overcome whatever is in my life in order that I can be a vessel that God can use. Now, I'm even talking about it takes faith to go to this book and say, you know what, God, whatever this book says, I will do it. So, I went to this book as a baby Christian. The book said, lifting holy hands. Okay, I'll lift holy hands because the Bible says, be doers of the word and not hearers, only to see. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourself together. The manner is, the reason why there's less and less attendance to the house of God is not because we don't have programs for them. If we have the word, they ought to be here. But it takes faith to come and hear the word. See, it, listen, when you go to Ryan's or you go to a big fancy eating place and you go there, that doesn't take faith to get you there. You know what got you there? Your belly got you there. It wasn't faith. Your taste buds got there. Listen, it takes faith to go hear the word of God because you know you need the word of God. It doesn't take faith to go somewhere where they're giving your flesh what it wants. Because your flesh will drive you there. Listen, nobody had to convince me to go to the bar and get a beer. My flesh drugged me to the bar. See, it takes faith to say, no, I'm not drinking that no more. See, faith overcomes the world. Faith says no to the devil and yes to God. That's what faith says. I'm telling you right now, if I was not pastoring, and if I was not out ministering, I, I, I would go somewhere where I could get faith fed spiritually to become more like Jesus. I would. I'd go somewhere where I knew they were going to take the word and whip my blessed assurance and, help and bring correction into my life. That takes faith. It takes faith to sit here and let somebody tell you the truth and though the truth hurts. So let me just show you what is going on here. See, because the Bible says, for as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even as many that believe on his name. It takes to that he gave them power to become. He was made sin that we might be made the righteousness. So we know in Matthew chapter 5, it tells us what? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they who are mourn. Blessed are the meek. Listen to this. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled what will you be filled with righteousness if I was hungry for uh, uh, let's say a banana chocolate split a, a Sunday a split uh, uh, a chocolate Sunday whatever what do they call them I, you'd find me at the Dairy Queen I'm gonna get filled with whatever I'm hungry for so if I say I'm the righteousness of God I'm the righteousness of God and I think I'm righteous when I'm not hungry to be righteous. But, Pastor, we can't become righteous in ourselves. No, it's only in God. 
God, I want to be, I want to live in your righteousness. I want to live in your holiness. I want to live in your purity. But if I can convince you psychologically, oh, I'm already righteous. You'll not hunger for righteousness. And if you don't hunger for righteousness, righteousness brings you into holiness. Did you know that? And it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. There's a process. Poor, mourning, meek, hungry, pure in heart, and they'll see God. That's a whole sermon in itself. People aren't really dividing the word of truth. So we got people, Christians, who will never really live right lives because they're not hungry for righteousness. Because they say, I'm already righteous. Let me, let me give an example. People all the time, I don't know why, people like to sing in front of people. 90% of the time, people tell me who they, they can sing. Yeah, I can, I can sing for the Lord. I can really sing. See, I just make a joyful noise. I can really sing. I say, really? You can sing? Yeah, praise God, I can sing. I say, here, here's the mic. Let me hear you. <clears throat> and they get to singing, and I say, oh, okay, give me the mic back. You know why? They really can't sing. They think they can sing. So we got people who are saying they're righteous, but their actions prove otherwise. They say they're righteous, but they're not living righteous lives. They're not obeying God. They're not following God. They're not serving God. What does this have to do with Pastor Mike with, 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 with Moses? What does this have to do with the woman bent over people? Are slaves they don't even know it now the Lord appears to Moses in a burning fiery bush Moses goes the great I am speaks the very first thing the great I am says the very first character that you discover about God is he's holy when you get into heaven the very first thing you discover about God is he's holy. That's the first thing, he's holy. How come we're not discovering that in the house of God? Now, everybody has a different understanding of what holiness is. I understand this. But holy, he's a holy God. He's a consuming fire. He appears to Moses as a consuming fire. The voice of the Lord speaks out, says, you're standing on holy ground. Take off your shoes. He says, okay. He says, now that you've discovered I'm a consuming fire, now that you've discovered I'm a, I'm a holy God, he said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Joseph. He said, now I'm going to br bring deliverance to Egypt, to Israel out of Egypt. He, and he says, I can't, I can't. You know why? He's right. You can't, Moses. You cannot. You cannot. You cannot. He said, but I can. See, Moses tried to do it, and he failed. Thank God for failures. Because if you never failed, you'd never know it was only God that could do it. He says, now go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. See, that's what we need today. Man, we need some Moses. We need some Joshua's. We need some Joseph's. We need some, we need some Elijah's. We need some Elijah's. We need, we need some people that will rise up. And you know, for, I'd say for over a month now, the Lord has been quickening to me about how with a mighty right arm he led the children of Israel out of captivity. And it's almost like when Jesus said to the woman who was bent over with a spirit of infirmity, woman, be thou loosed from thine infirmity. And of course, the, the loose means to be untied, to be unbound. For in other words, she was a slave to that physical infirmity. Come on, man. People are slaves to addictions, to a desires, to thoughts, to doctrines. You don't think I deal with people who got messed up doctrines and you can show them, they say they're Christians, you can show them in the Bible what they believe is wrong, but they can't see it. You know why? Because they're a slave to that doctrine. They're a slave to a lying spirit. For instance, we know there's people who, they, 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 well, God doesn't heal anymore. Excuse me? Who told you that lie? Well, you know, he doesn't do miracles anymore. Well, you know, Pastor Mike, now that we're born again, we're washed in the blood, we don't really have to live holy. Oh, is that right? We don't have to live holy? 
Uh, I, I said, you know, I, when the Lord showed me this years ago, back in 1 Corinthians 16, I think it's a verse 20, I think it is, it says, if any man loves not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be basically damned. And I said to pastors, because I used to do pastors' conferences, I said to pastors, I thought, well, I'm just going to check this out. I said, hey, brothers, do you have to love God to go to heaven? I'd ask pastors that. Do you have to love God to go to heaven? And they would stare at me like I lost my mind, and they would not answer me. I mean, no, you've got to love God to go to heaven. You've got to love God to go to heaven. But we're being told, oh, yeah, all you got to do is pray a prayer. No, you've got to love God. <clears throat> you've got to love God to go to heaven. I mean, that just makes sense, doesn't it? Is God going to marry someone? Isn't that the first commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, strength, and being, and then thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Would you, you know what? If I was going to go marry my wife to be, and I said to her, Kathy, do you love me? And she said, well, no, no, I don't really love you. I just like your looks. I just like your money. Of course, when we got married, she had to buy our wedding bands. Did, honey, I mean, Kathy, do you love me? Nah, you're just, you're just the only choice I've had so far. No one else has proposed, so I guess I might as well just take you. You know what? I'd be stupid to marry her. God is going to get married to a bride that loves him. But you say, what does this have to do? He said, let my people go. Now, when he went in, he went, went with, and, and the Israelites, now they're crying out, help, help, help. And they are, you can study it, they're crying. He said, and matter of fact, God said to Moses, I've heard their voice. I've seen their weeping, their tears, their crying. Help, help. We don't want to be slaves no more. We're tired of making these, these bricks with straw. Uh, they took our firstborn boys and they threw them into the Nile, gave them to the crocodiles. We're tired of the oppression. We've been a slave all these years. We're fed up with it. We don't want to be slaves no longer. We cannot get free. Egypt had the greatest army the world had ever seen at that time. And God says, I'm going to do it with a mighty outstretched arm. And Moses goes in there with that rod, which is the rod of authority, the word of God, symbolic of Jesus. He goes in there and he says to Pharaoh, the great I am sent me and he's telling me to tell you something. What's that? Let my people go. It said that almost 10 times, up to 14 times in different ways. Let my people go. Let my people go. I believe with all my heart that that was symbolic of what God is about to do again. He did it in the book of Acts. He showed up and he said to the devil, remember he overcame principalities and powers and made her show them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let my people go. I believe that's what revival is. I really do. I'm convinced that's the move of the Holy Spirit. When God shows up and says, enough's enough, devil, you let my people go. That's enough. You got, you got my people by the thro throat, by worldly entertainment, worldly games, worldly flesh, ungodly desires. You've got them by the throat. You're messing up their lives. They're my people. All the earth is mine and, and, and every man and woman and child that lives in it. You let my people go. Pastor Mike, do you really believe that God is going to show up in that way? Yeah, he's done it through the ages. But I believe there's going to be one final climatic explosion. He's going to show up and he is going to show up and he's going to say, enough's enough. Let my people go. And he's going to do it with a mighty outstretched arm. And he's going to overcome, you know, he's going to do it. Because you know what? The world ain't going to want to let go of you. The world ain't going to let go. You know what, matter of fact? The world would rather kill you than to let you go. Can, can I tell you something? A revival is the worst thing that can happen for the economy. What do I mean? My wife goes, huh? A revival is the worst thing that can happen for the economy. Why is that? Because all of a sudden, people are content with what they've got, and not only that, but they want to get rid of everything that's in their way. Take a look in the book of Acts chapter 4. When revival came, it says, and what did they do? 
Well, they had a big old bonfire. They brought out all the books on witchcraft and all the other different religions, all the different things, and they burned it. And then what did they do? They sold all that they had. They laid it at the feet of the apostles. Not that they could live high in the hog. Not that they could get the best chariot and the best horse and the biggest house. Oh, Pastor Mike, they didn't have mansions in them days. You, you better go back and look at Rome, man. They had mansions, man. They still got some hanging around from way back then. You know what they did? They didn't care about stuff. That's why I can tell you right now what's been going on in the church, all this materialism, it ain't God. Because when it's a real move of God, I don't care about I don't care about rings and jewelry and fancy stuff. I won't care about it. I want die man, if I had a Rolex watch on my arm and I and somebody say, Give me your Rolex or I'll kill you, I say, Oh man, here, here's my Rolex, here's my shoes. You want my shirt? Here I don't care about that stuff. See? But so he said, Let my people go. The Holy Ghost is gonna set people free from stuff. Well, I can't go to church. Football's on tonight. Gonna set them free. Well, I can't go to church be because I remember when I was a kid, I don't know if they still do it, when I was a kid, we'd all gather around the TV on Sunday nights to watch Walt Disney. I mean, that was a family. Well, you know, Sunday, they say this in churches. Well, Sunday night is family night. Well, how about the family of God? Aren't we family? But the Spirit of the Lord is going to arrest them. Now, here's what they didn't understand, though, because we're talking about where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. When God shows up, when the Holy Ghost shows up, when the Holy Spirit has His way, all of a sudden He begins to prune, He begins to purge, He begins to cleanse the pot, He begins to chastise, He'll begin, hey, don't, don't look at Pastor Mike, because oh, Pastor Mike's got some problems. Don't worry, the Holy Ghost will take care of him. See, the Holy Ghost will make a quick work. And he says he's going to make a quick work. The Holy Ghost, when he shows up, will transform you. He did it to Peter. He did it to Saul of Tarsus. Look at how Saul was changed. Saul became a Paul overnight. And within a matter of days, he was preaching the gospel. He was preaching it so strong and so persuasively that they said, we got to kill him. What happened? The Holy Ghost came. See how fast the Holy Ghost can do this? How many have heard testimonies of people who were this way one moment and then radically this person the next moment? That's what the Holy Ghost does. It wasn't counseling. It wasn't hours and hours of sitting down and trying to get someone to think right. The Holy Ghost took it, turned it inside right, and made the person a completely different person. How many need a move of God like that? I had that kind of experience. Uh, uh, Brother Angel, you had that kind of experience, didn't you? I mean, you were here and all messed up and goofed up one minute. I know you were because of the tattoos on your arms. You didn't do that since you've been saved, have you? Huh? You didn't put that there since you've been saved, right? <laughs> I got a tattoo, too. I know. I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying, look what God did. See, he may have those tattoos still, but he's not the same man he was. Since he sits on the front row, I can use them <laughs> as an illustration. See, God will make you by a move of the Spirit. That's why I'm not, I look at the world. I go, wow. Listen, I not only look at the world, I look at the church world. I look at people who say they know God, and I go, oh, Lord. They don't read their Bible. They don't pray. They don't come to the house of God. They don't even tithe. They don't even give 10%. They, they, don't, they don't share their faith. They, they, they don't cry over souls. They don't. And I go, God, I said it's going to take a move of the Holy Ghost. But you know what? When the Holy Ghost comes on them, they'll be different. Boom. A friend of mine years ago, he was like a part of a, of a small mob, and he was kind of the leader of it. He come home one day, walked into the house, been drinking. His wife had been watching TV, Christian TV, Pat Robertson. He went berserk. He started screaming at her, yelling at her, started hitting her in the head. What was his wife's name, honey? Julie. Started beating Julie up. His name was Sparky. 
start beating Julie up, yelling, screaming. I don't work all these hours for you can sit and watch that blankety bank stuff on TV. He's yelling at her, screaming at her. She's crying. She runs down because I've been to their, their, it was a house trailer, ran down the hallway. He went after her. He got halfway down the hallway. Something hit him and he fell to his knees. Amazing testimony. Fell to his knees, started weeping and crying. He said he found himself on the hallway of his trailer house weeping and crying. He turned around and crawled back. He got in front of the TV right when, when Pat Robertson was praying the prayer of salvation. Sparky said he had to pray it, and he cried out, and he prayed the prayer of salvation. At the same time, I think he got filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. So one minute, here's a man who's about to kill his wife for watching that stupid religious junk. And the next minute, he's weeping and crying and speaking in a heavenly language. And God got such a hold of him that with just in a matter of weeks, amazing miracles were happening in his life. Just like that, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost. But see, when the Spirit of God came upon Sparky, he gave everything to God. It was none of this halfway bit. He just poof, gave everything to God, and God showed up. Isn't that what we need? You know how many sparkies there are out there? Man, you know how many people are out there? Man, they just need a touch of the Holy Ghost. They need Jesus. Now, as we get ready to finish here, let me say this is what happened. So God, with a mighty outstretched arm, plague after plague, you know, the Red Sea, the blood, and the, and the fire, and the, and the ice, and, the, and, and, and the, the fleas, and the locusts, and the, and, and, and the cattle dying, on and on and on, and the firstborn, the Passover, and all of a sudden he brings them to the Red Sea, and he holds out the rod of authority, and he splits the Red Sea. And they walk over on dry sod land. Now here's the, here's the thing. They thought they were free now. We're free, 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 free indeed. This is a song I'm making up. They thought they were free, but they weren't free. They were free from the clutches of Pharaoh, but they weren't free from what was inside of them. And so now God takes them into the wilderness because he says, now I got, there's things in you that ain't right. I've got to free you from you. <laughs> and that's the greatest freedom there is when you're finally free from you. Free from your worries, your fears, your anger, your strife, your misunderstandings, your thoughts, your desires. Free, where Paul finally said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but it's Christ that lives within me. And that's freedom. So God, I believe, because right now, I know we don't have a nation where the government has us under the thumb 100%. I mean, we are under the control to some extent, but this is what God wants to do. God wants to set us free from me. Now, when I say from me, I don't mean you from me. I mean me from me. God wants to set me free from me. God wants to set me free from me, that I can be a vessel that he can work through. I, I know, you know, I have read you know what, if I just looked at the modern day teaching and preaching, if I just followed the modern day preachers, I, I wouldn't go very deep in God. Can I say that honestly? Because they're, they're not deep. Holiness, true holiness, true obedience. I got to go back. I got to go back into the old time preachers. I got to go back to the Welsh revival, the Azusa Street revival. I got to go back to the, the now they, the, the Finneys and the, and the Wesleys and the Whitfields. And, the, and, and how about the guy who started Salvation Army? I've got to go back to William Booth. I've got to go back. I've got to go back to men who are right. I've got to go back to the book of Acts. I've got to go back and take a look at these men and women and go, God, you did it for them. You moved in them. You flowed through them. You brought revival through them. You did awesome works through them. Lord, won't you, Smith Wigglesworth, won't you do it through us? Mary Woodworth Etter, won't you do it through us? Sure he will. Sure he will, but you got to want it. You know, God gives you the desires of your heart. God wants us. 
I really, I know it sounds ridiculous, but Smith Wigglesworth would shut down hospitals. Did you know that? They had a, a, a death school. It was a place for deaf people. He went there. He said, bring out all the deaf people. And they brought all these people of death out, and they brought out, and then he went to a place for dumb and so forth and so on, and he went down a line, and we got done. All of the people who could not hear could hear, and they shut the school down. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And then you could turn it to a church. Hello? I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful? He'd go to places, and they'd be crippled, and they all get healed. Why would God do that for Smith? Well, you know, Smith had a special anointing. Oh, Smith paid a price. <laughs> I must not have been willing to pay that kind of price yet. I need to pay that kind of price. I really do. I need to, I need to pay the price. You know, sometimes what happens, this is a true story as we close. I, my son, Daniel, years ago, he, got, um, <clears throat> he brought home this little raccoon with his friend. Wild raccoon, little wild raccoon. He brought it in, cute little raccoon, and, Dad, can I keep it? Can I keep it? Make a long story short. Yeah, yeah, you can keep it. My wife spoke up. Honey, in Pennsylvania, you, and I had a raccoon when I was a little boy growing up. Back in them days, they didn't have laws against this. They said, you're not allowed to have tick wild animals. And now you can buy a, you can buy a raccoon from a licensed dealer because they know they've had rabies shots, they've had distemper, they've had shots, you know, and they've gone through all the, you know, all the different shots, and, and uh, I kind of rose up in pride, and I said, nah, I had a raccoon when I was a kid. He can, have a, he can have a raccoon. So he had this little raccoon, and this raccoon was growing bigger and bigger and bigger. He says he don't remember this, but I remember him coming to me one night all upset, and he said to me, he said, Dad, I had, a, I had a dream. I had a dream about this raccoon. What was the name of that raccoon, Dan? Bandit. So I had a, I had a dream about Bandit. He said he began to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger, and he was humongous, and he was in my room, and Dad, he was going to devour me. He was going to eat me. I should have known right then and there something was wrong, but I didn't. So time went on, and raccoons growing. And all of a sudden, the raccoon began to act a little bit strange. He began to bump into stuff, began to fall over, began to act really strange. And Danny got sick. He got really sick. He really got sick. And I looked at that raccoon one day. I walked into his bedroom, and that raccoon, totally disorientated. Now, it wasn't distemper. I had a distempered ra uh, uh, skunk that attacked my dog out back, Ranger. Eyes were all puffed up, yellow. I looked up what distemper does. Distemper, pussy, just terrible. This raccoon did not have distemper. Raccoon's falling over, and all of a sudden, it hit me. He's got rabies. Oh, no. This raccoon's got rabies. My son is running a fever. He, he looks like he's going to die. Oh, no, God. My son's, got this. My son's got rabies. And all the kids in the church have been. So we caught up, this, we caught up the, uh, wh whoever you're supposed to call up, the animal control people. We told them what was going on. They said, oh, sir. They said, if that raccoon really does have rabies, then everybody that has been in contact with that raccoon is going to have to. Uh, take rabies shots. They're going to have to get treated. And I told them the condition of my son, and they said, if what you're telling us is true, it's too late for him. They told me this, it's too late for him. So they sent a man out. He looked at, my ra at the raccoon. He had a cage there. He looked at the raccoon, and he looked at me, and he said, he's a forest ranger, you know, the whole uniform on. He said, you know, it was illegal for you to have this coon, don't you, sir? And I did have to pay a fine. They did fine me. I said, I, di I did, sir. I knew it. I said, but I, uh, I justified it. I said, I I'm sorry, minister. I said, Reverend, I'm so sorry, because he's looking at bandit. He said, I am so sorry. He said, if I've ever seen an animal that had rabies, that animal has rabies. And from what you're describing to me about your son, it's too late for him. Now, everybody else, we're going to have to give them shots and take them through the process. And we had a woman that was pregnant. How many months pregnant was Lori, Mom? Seven months, she was going to have to, her precious little children were going to have to get taken care of. The, 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 I mean, congregation had brought, he'd be licking their faces and licking their hands. You know, they pass it by saliva, you know, and, and he'd been licking Danny's wounds. And so this is what we did. I pulled my whole family together, my, my sons and my daughter. And I don't know if they remember it, but we all wept and cried, and we wept and cried, and we wept and cried, and we said, God, we're so sorry, God. 
God, please have mercy on us. Oh, God, we got desperate. I got desperate. And after we wept and cried for a time together, all huddled together, and we're weeping and we're crying, and we're crying out to Jesus, I went into my family room where I had a wood stove, and after they had all gone into their rooms, and Danny's running a fever, and he's in his bedroom basically dying. He's dying. I go into my front room, and I open up the doors on my wood stove, and I scooped out all the ashes from the logs, and I dumped them over my body, got deathly sick, got into my lungs, but I rolled and prayed and wept and cried all night long in the ashes. God, have mercy. God, have mercy. God, have mercy, oh God. God, in the name of Jesus, Danny will not die. Danny will not die. The, 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 the rabies, the rabies that have spread into the congregation will go, it will go, it will go. So all night long, I cried out, I cried out fervently. The fervent prayer of a righteous man of I repented and I prayed 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 and I prayed. Crying out, crying out, oh God, have mercy. Oh God, have mercy. So the night went. The morning came, and the burden lifted. I got up. I knew in my heart something had happened. Went to see Danny. The fever was gone. He was okay. Got a phone call. They had taken the coons had sent it off to get it examined. Whatever they do, they came back, and they said, you know what? We can't explain it. We can't find anything. <laughs> Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. But let me ask you something. How come I got desperate for my son, and for my family, and for this congregation at that time, but we don't get desperate like that for everything? Why don't we get desperate? It's the flesh. There's times when I should be desperate, man. There's times I should be Man, I should be desperate. I, I remember when Danny, when he was real little, I don't know why he was always getting in trouble. He got into the back of my sister's car. Was it my sister's car? And there was that three-in-one oil, whatever it is. He liked to suck on anything. He sucked on a can of three-in-one oil. He got it into his lungs, took him to the doctor. He couldn't hardly breathe. They x-rayed his lungs. They showed us his lungs were all coated with this chemical. They said, we're sorry, we can't help you. This, th this will never go away. He'd get so congested at night, he couldn't breathe. I would pick him up weeping and crying and walk the floor with him my, in my arms, commanding it to come out of his lungs. Come out of his lungs, you lying devil. Come out of his lungs. And he'd begin to breathe normal, and I'd put him back to bed. And this went on day after day, week after week, month after month, but it became less and less and less. Until one day it disappeared, and it never came back. I had to get desperate. I had to get desperate. We got to get desperate. We got to say, devil, let my son go. Devil, let my husband go. Devil, let my, let my family go. Let them go. Let them go. Let them go. Let them go. But... Man, that takes faith, doesn't it? Faith that won't let go of the altar. Just God. Whew. There's so many other ways that are similar. And, and I'm, I'm guilty. Hey, say Pastor Mike's guilty. I'm guilty of taking the pathway of least resistance. <laughs> I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. God, help us. Because there's a price. Yeah, I, but Pastor Mike, Jesus paid the price. Oh, yeah, but now, remember, we take his yoke. There's a price we got to pay. H how many of you ever really have seen a move of God? Let me see your hands. You've really seen a move of God, okay? How many of you acknowledge somebody paid a price to see that move of God? I'm telling you, if we're going to see a move of God, it's going to cost you something. You'll never regret the price you paid for a move of God, but you'll always regret the fact that you didn't pay it. Father, we just thank you for this night. I know there's not many of us here, but Lord, I believe it's a progressive taking us in, Lord, of seeking your face. Lord, you're just whittling away every obstacle, every deception, 
every illusion, everything trying to hold us back. And Lord, help us to be like Paul. We can't change what happened yesterday, forgetting those things that are behind, but we can believe God for change today in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen.